All right, we are now live. Um, well, we, we've been live this entire time, but everyone can see us now. Well, except for our enigmatic video essayist, which is okay. <laughs> uh, I know, I know one of one of the, uh, the the folks in the chat, Eisendale, who's a moderator on the Asians Represent uh, Discord server, was like, "Are we going to see the face behind the voice?" <laughs> Keep waiting. I wish you were. No, I wish um, you were just that, like Detective Conan, like black silhouette. Oh my God! I mean, we've that's what we've got on screen. Yeah, uh, I just say really I grew up to look like a serial killer, so this is just very appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm super excited for this. I think that um, I'm a little bit starstruck. I'll, I'll say it. I'll, I'll be up front. I'm super starstruck by 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 all three of you. Uh, the the contributions that you've all made to you know not only like the discussion of Asian representation in, in, you know, in, in pop culture, in, in gaming, in, you know, in, in film, but also the fact that, you know, all of you are out here trying to educate people in your own way and leveraging your expertise and your skills, right? Uh, you know, many, like, I remember first seeing a certain Twitter thread about Mulan when oh I was God. when I was watching Mulan for the first time with my family, um, I had paid for it at Disney Plus. At my my mom, oh. my dad, my brother, my girlfriend, and we were all watching Mulan at my parents' house. And the entire oh. time, we were all like, "What the fuck is this?" Oh my um, God, I'm sorry. That no, you paid for that. I pirated yeah. it. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay yes, it's because. Okay. Because of that moment, I was distracted and turned to Twitter and immediately found y your, your thread. And oh my God, that's so funny. Made it so, so let's just say I paid 30 bucks to watch a crap movie and then discover an amazing creator. Um, <laughs> so why don't we start with that? This is very much my style. We've never, the, you know, the four of us have never collaborated before, but my style is all about, you know, hyping you folks up because I think you're all, you're all fucking awesome. Um, now, this is an a Asians represent stream. We curse, you know, we, we keep it real here. Um, okay. So, like, you know, if we got feelings, we, you know, we, we put them out there. Um, that said, hello, everyone. It's it's late where, where a couple of us are, but what's really great about this is that we have figured out a time zone friendly, um, you know, time to meet. It's a time to have this conversation about Asian representation. So I have three incredible creators and I'll keep saying incredible because that's what they are. Uh, three incredible creators here to kind of talk about Asian representation in media because that's something that has been kind of the talk of the town. You know, there have been some incredible movies that have, you know, come out this year and will be coming out uh, with a lot of Asian people in it. Um, this is also a time where, you know, folks who look like us and may not look like us because there's a lot of diversity within the Asian community are facing a lot of violence. Uh, there's a lot of fear of Asians. And this is a really important time for us to kind of get together and talk about, you know, our communities and how we can uplift our communities through our content and how media that we consume and the media that is produced with the intention of us buying into it can do it better. So I want to start with Shiran, the, the person who's Twitter thread made the thirty dollars I sunk into Mulan entirely worth it. Uh, was it though? Was oh, it worth it? I think it was worth it. I think it was worth <laughs> it because I, I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned a lot because not only are you a masterful crafter of of Twitter threads, but you are also a YouTuber because of your distaste for this one movie. Because of that movie, my God, I still can't believe how it happened. I was just like, I'm yeah. just gonna throw this video up there, and then. And then I forgot about it. And then like three days later, someone was like, hey, your video has like 100,000 views. And I was like, what? Yeah, what? And now it's got like over 2 million views. Yeah. Which is, which is, just, which is incredible. Yeah, that's I mean, wild. you're not only a, 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 I don't want to say accidental YouTuber. I am an accidental oh, okay. YouTuber though. That's completely like, it was a complete accident. That's I never was like, I never had <laughs> dreams of being like, a YouTube commentator, like a YouTube commentary, like a commentary YouTuber. Like that was not ever one of my dreams, but I somehow think, it just happened. <laughs> I think the youths call it a react YouTuber. Is that what the youths call it? I don't know. Um, well, I guess, yeah, that first video was kind of a react, but yeah. 
but I think it's more commentary. But I don't know. It's just yeah. I think it's a it's, somehow, a, it's a mix. You you've yeah, got uh you produce. It works. I I wrote down that you just you produce fantastic videos on YouTube, basically about Chinese history and culture and how you know you have some educational content there. You have some commentary. You have some reactions. But you're not only this accidental YouTube. You're you're also an author, and yeah, you actually, have a, that was intentional. That one was intentional, not an accidental yeah. author. Um, that one was like my intentional career. <laughs> and you've got a YA novel coming out mm -hmm. uh, on September twenty first. The the yeah. date this Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, a special date in Chinese culture um, yeah. this year. Indeed. Totally planned. Totally. Yes, planned. the Mid Autumn Festival is when my book will come out, and it's yes. Yeah, and it is. Families will get together to go to the bookstore to buy this book. I hope so, or or you know, order it online, pre-order it. We'll put yes. all the links in you know in the descriptions and our in our show notes. But yeah, this book is called Iron Widow, and the pitch immediately grabbed me because you're like, it's got the stylings of Pacific Rim, it's got The Handmaid's Tale, which I still can't watch because it's just too real for me. Um, oh yeah, and it's a retelling of a really awesome historical Chinese story about Wu Zetian, the only female emperor. And you have yeah, released a video only, on her. I only say um, The Handmaid's Tale because that's like the one female dystopia that um, Westerners know. But truly, it's actually, um, I will copy more. It's just like a Gongdo drama, just like a Chinese harem drama. I mean, I, like, I, that's where my inspiration really comes from instead of The Handmaid's Tale. And the, and the art that you've posted about that has been like, oh, I know exactly what this is tonally. I'm down. Uh, oh. I'm down. Now, now that said, you know we have two other people whose work have you know really influenced me during this pandemic. It's it's content that I've really loved to you know to watch while I'm working because you know I work from home now. Um, I want to start with you, CJ, because uh, you're the reason why this all started. Uh, you oh, DM'd me on Twitter. You're like, hey, you want to do something? And I was like, oh yeah, I, it would it would. Of course. And you're like, well, Shang-Chi's coming out in September. Do you want to time it around that? And I said, okay. Fully right, knowing yeah. that I wasn't going to go to theaters to watch it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, back then, we didn't know if Shang-Chi was going to come out digitally or in theaters, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, actually, this was supposed to be a Shang-Chi roundtable. So that's why all four of us are Chinese. And then, like, mm -hmm. the topic just kind of broadened. Yeah. And, and you know what? Here, yeah. Here's the thing. Um mm -hmm. We'll do introduction. We'll talk about the all, all of us being Chinese thing. But but CJ, mm -hmm. thank you for putting all of this together. But also thank you for the oh, content yeah, that works. you make. You've got like two incredible right. YouTube channels, Cool History mm -hmm. Bros, and right. Don't Stop Thinking, uh, amazing TTRPG right. channel. Um, right. yeah, thanks. I am just so happy that you know we're doing this because back in May when you reached out, you were like, "Hey, let's talk about Asian representation from the perspectives mm -hmm. of, in, in your words, Asians in Asia and Asians in right. America." Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and now mm -hmm. this is happening and we've got, okay, right, yeah. we've got one last uh, question. Yeah, well, oh, go the ahead. thing is, you know, yeah, right. The, the thing is, I, I think there is a great disconnect between, uh, how, um, you know, native, a, native born Asian, how uh, Asians in Asia themselves think about representation and Asian Americans. There's, it's like, there's a completely different world. Uh, they have a completely different needs. And the thing is, you know, maybe I'll start with something a bit provocative here is that they don't need representation. They don't want representation, but doesn't mean that they don't appreciate it. The, the thing that they want is not to be misrepresented. So that's a separate thing because uh, Asian Americans want to be accepted in the uh, US society, American society. The idea of representation is to uh, show Asian Americans in a good light in the way that you know, they can uh, assimilate within the American culture, the Western culture. But the people in Asia, they are proud of their own culture. Why do they need to be assimilated? And uh, it's just a completely uh, different need uh, from different side of people. Uh, there is a bit of a uh, connect, those people who are in between, maybe first gen migrants or people who work with Americans a lot, work in American company, or maybe who work in tourism, who accept American tourists into their country. You know, uh, it's like, uh, uh, that's why you know it, we have like some crazy people like Logan Paul or was it like Jake Paul? I think it's Logan Paul coming to Japan uh, doing Logan Paul. all these crazy things. Uh, it's just like messing with people just because he thinks he can. Uh, they don't really care much about Asians at all. So um, that's the issue they have with 
all this representation of Asian in, uh, you know, in America, in American media. Uh, to prepare for this conversation, I've talked with a lot of people from Southeast Asia, from uh, Asia itself. I've lived in Southeast Asia and different parts of Asia, visited all those sort of places. Uh, they have pretty much a similar opinion. Uh, they don't need to be shown in a good light. They are quite proud of uh, shown in the Western light because they're quite proud of themselves. It's just that, you know, don't misrepre misrepresent them. That's what they want. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a really interesting thing because, you know, we don't want to be only seen as the heroes. Being seen as a villain is okay. I mean, look at everyone who loves, you know, Tony Lung, right? It's like, it's, it's okay to be the villain. It's okay to be the hero. It's okay to, you know, be in between, right? But, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think what we're talking about is, you know, we want nuanced representation. We want to see Asian people in, in various roles. Um, and, you know, that's something that really strikes, you know, hard in my heart because mm -hmm. in, you know, an amazing video essay called Shang-Chi and the Perpetual Foreigners created by mm -hmm. our last panelist, Yang of Accented Cinema, you talked about, you know, your hopes that Shang-Chi the movie would portray a character who is kind of trapped in the liminal space between two worlds. I always say that like, oh, I'm a child of two worlds. I, you know, I was born in Toronto, I was raised in Toronto, and I never visited China until 2016. Um, and I never thought about trying to learn Chinese or really engage with my heritage uh, until oddly I, I lived in West Asia when I was working in West Asia. Uh, and mm -hmm. I thought, oh man, you know, I really want like a, like a cha siu bao, like so badly, um, which, I, which was an odd thing for me back in 2010. Um, and that said, you know, our last panelist known to many as Accented Cinema, you are a, a Chinese Canadian filmmaker who, who just makes these amazing bi-weekly video essays about, you know, Asian and world cinema from, you know, a really unique perspective. You aren't just talking about like, oh, take a look at these special effects or take a look at the technicality of the filmmaking, but you also weave in, you know, culture and philosophy and aesthetics into, you know, the conversation, which I think makes for some really unique content. And that said, you know, now that, you know, the audience knows who all of you are, I think it's time we kind of dive into this, this thing, this representation topic that CJ, you talked about. You talked about, you know, wanting to be represented right. in a more nuanced way and that people in Asia were like, yeah, we mm -hmm. just don't want to be misrepresented. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, the thing is, you know, um, I think we need to know where people's position are so that, you know, there is uh, no misconnect because I see lots of like uh, commenters saying, oh, uh, actually, Asians say this is bad. Uh, uh, certain movie is bad, it's a failure. Like, for example, people in China doesn't like Sang chi and so on. But to be honest, that movie, uh, I don't know what it's trying to be, but I don't think it is uh, made for them in the first place. Because uh, the first obvious thing is that, you know, what are these Chinese people doing speaking English? You know, right. That's a really big disconnect. Uh, the, you know, just imagine, uh, uh, we see a bunch of Americans uh, in Japan speaking Japanese or in uh, China speaking Chinese. That's going to sound really weird for them. And um, I think uh, it's just that uh, it's easy for people in uh, United States or in the rest of America uh, seeing that there is something foreign about this. It has a bit of like uh, people are more sensitive to foreign elements. Just because there are just some uh, Chinese elements, they think uh, it's made for China. But you know, people in China, they, they would think that what are they doing speaking uh, English and like they're looking everything from a Western perspective, uh, and uh, everything is made really weird. So uh, there is a sort of uncanny valley that makes it difficult for people to understand. Mm. And actually, for people from different sort of like culture, it's easier to accept something that the they don't know much about because uh, looking at all different blockbuster lists uh, in Japan, Sanchi is number one. Uh, in India, it is number one. In many different parts of the world, it's number one. People enjoy it. People really enjoy it. But uh, uh, it's great because you know it's uh, it 
it is a success uh, for a certain representation. It is not perfect. Um, everybody just wants everything to be perfect. But I think it's a great step. But uh, it's success for who? We need to like uh, determine uh, what uh, you know. What is this for? Who is this for? So that you know, we just don't say it is not perfect. It doesn't make everyone happy, so it's a failure. So we need to be able to count our successes and move forward from there, and not be bogged down by all this criticism from people uh, with from different directions who have like different needs and different wants. So that you know. Um, it's easier for us to progress. Yeah, and I think you know having conversations like this are, you know, a great way of doing that. I think another thing with like the finance. I mean, Shang Chi was never going to fail. Impossible, right? It is Disney has put what 150, 200 million dollars into this movie, and it is a Marvel movie. It it was bound to make money, and it was only a question of how much money was it going to make. And I, I think that in and of itself is a really good thing. Because we as a community and Asian folks in general can actually go and be critical of it and have, I guess, different perspectives of this movie without worrying about like, okay, we all got to back up Shang-Chi because if it doesn't succeed, there's going to be no more, right? And, 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 I think that's, and, I, and I think that's why I really liked Yang, your most recent video. I would love to know more about like, what kind of came of that? Because in the video, I got the impression that you know you were excited for the movie. You went to go see it um, again. Shiran and I have not seen it yet, um, but you know you were excited for the movie. You wanted to go see it, and you know you pointed out some really interesting things technically about the filmmaking. Um, but then you also noted this thing, and, and you mentioned this movie. And I, I have a really big DVD collection, um, and. I love this movie so much. Uh, Rumble in the Bronx. Yeah. I love, I, I fucking love this movie so much for, for like numerous reasons. Um, one, I think it was badass that Jackie was wearing like a cast at the end of this movie because he broke mm-hmm. his foot. Um, but at the same time, I think that Rumble in the Bronx, like you mentioned in your video, is the kind of story that I wish, I wish, you know, Shang-Chi would have leaned into. Uh, I, I'd too. love for you to talk, talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, because I went into the um, how should I say my expectation originally for the film was not that high. Uh, it was only after the reviews came out that I started to feel a little bit more interest in it. Um, because if you look back in the first trailer, they put a lot of emphasis on the location that is San Francisco, and uh, if you look at the um, the poster, like that for some reason they included a Golden Gate Bridge behind Aquafina, despite the composition looking completely awful. So I went into the film with this expectation that San Francisco is heavily featured uh, as a background for the for the story. So like what Ant-Man and the Wasps were, uh, did, right? An urban Kung Fu fantasy film with some Chinese elements. Instead, um, the moment they went to Macau, I was like, oh no, this is not going to the direction I wanted. Uh, it, the film sort of takes uh, a journey, the, like the classic hero's journey where the main characters start from home, which is San Francisco, and went step by step further and further away from what he's used to and go back, in this case, to China, starting from Macau, which, uh, which is probably one of the most westernized area in China, and then to mainland China where the uh, his father's hideout is, and eventually enter a mystical, uh, a mystical for magic, uh, a magical area that is a fictionalized wuxia version of China. And by that point, despite every, everyone speaking English for some reason, Shang-Chi no longer really interacts with this Asian American identity. By that point, the whole film feels like a American Disney fi version of Crouching Tiger. And that just something at that moment I realized, I don't need this. I don't think anyone really need to see this. 
or like it's not aiming at anyone specifically except maybe um non-asian people who are interested in a fast food version of chinese culture because it's comforting it's all the elements it includes like um chinese architecture chinese mythological uh bees that make cameos uh, a bamboo forest a dragon that can, comes out of nowhere uh these elements feel very comforting to a western audience because it's familiar but if for me or for anyone who are from, who are actually came from this cultural background they just look like a collage of while authentically depicted elements are not a cohesive experience that i was looking for so i end up coming out of this film i had a good time with the techniques of the film i just don't i was just somewhat confused on what the intended who the intended audience for the film is yeah i i really want to talk about that um the signifiers of in this case chinese culture and being chinese right they they take a lot of one of the things that really initially made me angry was when people were like oh my god shag chi stole from pokemon it's like it's a nine tails <laughs> yeah yeah um uh, one of the things that i think is uh, one of the reasons why i i think a lot of people you know reacted that way was because i from what i gather a lot of the portrayals of mythological beasts uh many from like the shanghai jing are kind of done without context or divorced from their original sort of of purpose mm -hmm. in in Chinese literature and the Chinese understanding of the natural world um uh, because that's very much what the the you know the classics of mountains and seas is it's a uh, if you play dungeons and dragons it's basically an ancient chinese monster manual in a very very interesting way yeah there oh, oh no. no zoom oh don't do this to me yeah, here's my copy my copy is out of reach but yours looks way better than mine. Um it's an incredible book and I think there is a a wealth of very very interesting material that can be used there. But you're right. You know, in your video you you say that, you know, this is an idea of, you know, what Disney and what they think non-chinese people are going to like or what they recognize as chinese it's safe it plays it really safe um in a way that doesn't really drive you know the hard hitting sort of you know representation that many mm -hmm. folks of the diaspora were really looking for and i think we kind of saw that with you know with mulan they they're like oh the phoenix oh this is what she is we don't have to dive dive into that but unless we want to um but yeah this is what chi is it's magical and you can only be good if you have all of this chi um i know that you know uh shiran and, and yang you both talked about this at length in in your own respective videos and and twitter threads um but one thing that you said in your video was you know why go so far into our past to look for stories when there are plenty of stories to tell here and that's why i vibe so hard with rumble in the bronx that's why i think movies like and i keep talking about it blue bayou are incredible that's why i think minari was a huge hit mm -hmm. and and you know and that's why it's so awesome to see you know kelly marie tran play rose tico in star wars because a that wasn't an asian story and it was just hey we've got an asian character in star wars and that's super cool what they did with that character story that's a different that's a, that's an entirely different conversation yeah i mean she was in that final movie for like 30 seconds she was just like i'm here and i'm going to go now bye <laughs> hi <laughs> just kind of uh, walks yeah, off just... yeah like it was very clear that they just like straight up wrote her out of the movie Yeah, and I think in general with that they they really did a, a lot of people dirty with that movie. Like mm. John Boyega, I fully thought Finn was going to be a Jedi because of the way they they made all the posters. Oh my god, I see. Oh, that's true, yeah. They they oh, no. with the, with the lightsaber and everything. I was like, "Oh, this is going to be so awesome." And I saw The Force Awakens for the first time in Beijing. 
And I was telling my, my friend who had never watched Star Wars before, I was like, okay, so, so let me tell you everything about Star Wars. And I think there's going to be, this character's going to be a Jedi. And when we left the movie, he was like, I feel like you told me this story already. Oh my God. And I said, yes, let me take you out for dinner. I apologize. Oh my God. <laughs> but I, I really want to dive into, you know, this, this idea of, you know, who are we trying to represent and who are we trying to tell a story to? Um, and I think that kind of really touches on, correct me if I'm wrong, CJ, on what you mm -hmm. really want this panel to be about. Like, right. who are we trying to tell a story to? Um, yeah. Shiran, in, in your Avatar videos, you, you've talked, I say videos because you've done a, a couple of them. You've yeah. talked about, you know, the world of Avatar. And it really hit me hard because yeah, I, I'm one of the contributing designers to the Avatar tabletop RPG. Oh, uh, you are? Oh, my God. You no, guys but have so much funding now? Congratulations. <laughs> Yeah. What? <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. Yeah. Okay. No, I think it's cool. I, I think it's neat that, you know, people are really big fans of Avatar, but your videos are so important because you talk about how I signifiers of Asian-ness are used in Avatar mm -hmm. in a way that they're divorced of their actual, you know, context or cultural meaning. Yeah, like I like Avatar, but like... I don't think of its world as like authentic representation. I do think that it largely only uses um, like Asian, Asian cultural aesthetics as just aesthetics and not much more than that, even though like they do get into kind of Eastern philosophy. But again, I don't go, I don't watch Avatar to see myself and my culture represented. I just, I think it's cool that they have like, I just think it's a cool show, but like if I wanted authentic representation, I go back and I go watch Chinese stuff like stuff produced in China. Yeah. That 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 said you 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 mentioned authentic representation. When we're talking about Avatar, uh, first of all, CJ and Yang, have have you both watched Avatar or in, in its entirety or not? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I actually watched the first uh, I mean the first series, uh, the three seasons. I have uh, seen oh, yeah. that. Uh, the thing uh, what uh, makes it really interesting is that you know, I think it is a great uh, series for uh, Asian American representation, so that you know they can be represented in a way that is acceptable, uh, as easy to understand for the <clears throat> sorry for the Western audience. <clears throat> but as you know, Shiran has said, um, it's uh, you know it's really doesn't represent much of Asian thinking, Asian philosophy, and so on. And even in Asia itself, it's just interesting. If you go to uh, Chinese or Japanese um, sort of like board, you can look at it. Uh, people don't hate it just they don't understand it some five people really love it uh, among like you know if you compare to the number of ratings uh, in japanese like sort of like a anime rating sort of a site only five people rate it really well um on not that many people care about it but you know um and you know if you compare to dragon ball z or something like that it's like over a thousand people uh, rated it so there is a lot of interest in it and for example in china even Avatar, um, they know about it. Um, it's got a pretty good rating, uh, rated by 1,300 people. But if you compare it to Bojack Horseman, the Chinese love Bojack Horseman, 60,000 something rating. They love Bojack Horseman. Uh, they don't need Avatar because they can see much more uh, uh, Chinese stuff uh, that's more culturally appropriate for them. Uh, it's like... Uh, they need to, as you know, as yeah. Yang would have yeah. said, you know, they prefer to see Americana. Yeah. They don't need uh, this sort of Asian thing that's created by people who may not fully understand it. I, this is just like a personal question, but like, of all the things, yeah. Bojack Horseman. And Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty is really popular yeah. in China too. So, so what is it about those two things that are really, that make them really popular American properties in, in China. I'm genuinely like, I curious. I think, I honestly believe that it's because they touch on topics that aren't really touched on, um, are allowed to be touched on in Chinese media because like in Chinese media, everything has to go through the censorship board, like the censorship bureau. Mm -hmm. So everything that comes out is very sanitized and it doesn't really get into like the darker topics very much. And pretty much you can only find that kind of like gritty, darker exploration of like just psychology and mental health 
and of course like the sci-fi like wackiness in stuff like Bojack Horseman and Rick and Morty so like that's what Chinese audiences flock to American shows like like these for is that is true but also at the same time um I think this show just has that Americanness to it that a lot of other shows don't uh, especially Rick and Morty like to us it seemed like a normal show but it harkens back to the days of uh, Back to the Future which is very big in uh, in Hong Kong and in mainland uh, uh, during the time it was new so this show give us uh, give Chinese audience a a look into a what into what Chinese audience imagine American life to be uh, compared to a lot of other more fantasy property that may or may not based on Asia uh, like even compared to say He-Man or Shira the uh, Shira the reboot or Voltron which include giant, includes giant robots should be pretty popular don't do that well in China because like I said we watch Chinese people watch American shows to see America and Rick and Morty just has that quintessential American pop culture that we that is quite fascinating for Ch- a Chinese audience, right? So, so like I guess similarly, like shows like The Simpsons would also be hugely popular in, in China. Then, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't Simpsons think this so. may be a bit too heavily. Um, might, might be a like might be a bit too culturally relevant for Chinese people to get the humor. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. I think Family Guy may be more popular. Yes. And I think Two and a Half Men is really popular. Huh, okay. But like, American okay, the sitcoms first breakout oh, hit uh, of like American TV drama is Prison Break. Actually, like Prison Break <laughs> was like big in China. Okay. Of all things, I guess. I guess yeah, this is Prison Break. So I guess this kind of ties back into like you know people in China. I guess we could focus on China again because all four of us are Chinese. Uh, as as people have pointed out on the internet, um, we're talking about Asian representation, but you know this is a conversation in a sea of many that should be happening, right? Um, yeah. So let's let's talk about let's talk about that then. So you know Chinese people are not looking for Westerners to make stories about China; they are looking for yeah. stories produced internationally about those regions. So they want to see Americana, as as you pointed out, Yang, in in your video. They want to see Americana. They don't want to see people, you know, tell stories about China in a way that like Shang Chi did. Now, Shang Chi is not showing in China yet. It is currently not. It was not approved to show in China, and I don't know mm-hmm. if that has changed or will change. Um, mm. But <clears throat> when, I don't know. But, uh, but you know, I, I think you know it's a blessing in disguise. Uh, for like Asian representation, if it is not shown in China, it means that you know um, Asian American uh, media can succeed without having uh, just just by catering to the its audience. Because for representation, the most important audience that need to see this are actually Americans. Um, it's like uh, the uh, people in Asia. It's not like they are going to connect uh, with people in uh, you know, with with Asian Americans anyway, because Asian Americans live in America. That's their home. Um, that's uh, that's why, you know, uh, they are the ones who needed this more than the others. But it doesn't mean that, you know, um, they uh, people in Asia don't don't want to see that or they hate that because uh, to all those who have, I have spoken to, not a single one of them said, you know, stop doing it. Um, it's their freedom uh, to create media they just don't want to be misrepresented. misrepresented. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, just keep doing what you're doing. Um, um, people will improve. People will just uh, make better and better products. Um, and, you know, as long as we know, you know, what are the stakes for people from different sides of the world are, so we can just uh, create something that's uh, more effective uh, for uh, different people's uh, needs and objectives. Yeah, and, and I think that's a really good point, right? One movie cannot be representative of all Asians. And, you know, the media has kind of lifted Shang-Chi into that sort of category. This is the watershed moment for Asians in film. This is the moment. This is our moment in superheroes. This is our new crazy rich Asians. This is our new crouching tiger hidden dragon. 
memoirs of a geisha all the, the the big asian movies in the west yeah like i kind of wish they would stop doing that with like every asian movie that's made because like crazy rich asians i know it did well but like if you ask actual like southeast asians and singaporeans they're like oh they, they were not happy with that mm-hmm. movie yeah and they they made that movie for westerners and it, they did not touch on any of the social inequality in singapore especially from like this all sort of like predominantly like chinese cast they didn't. They aqua. No, aqua man, there were two Indian security guards. What are you true, talking? True. Sorry. What I fake fan here. Fake fan. Fake uh, fan. But but you know, like Aquafina was kind of like, I mean, Aquafina's role in media and Aquafina's appropriation of blackness is is a completely other conversation. But yeah, there's this this whole idea of you know people in Asia want to see stories that aren't about them because they can make their own. And the Chinese film industry is massive. You know, like, what are we looking at? Like, the biggest movies in, and correct me if I'm wrong, isn't it like Wolf Warrior or Wolf Warrior 2 is like oh the biggest it's movie? Is it, is it 2? Yeah, it's, it's two. Wolf Warrior 2. Oh my it's, God. That's the highest movie. grossing film in China. I have a lot of thoughts about that movie, but this is, yeah. it's gonna, they're gonna be too long. But oh my you, God. We can talk about have it. You guys Let's seen talk about Wolf it. Wolf Warrior 2? I've watched both of them. <laughs> really? Okay. I just like I died laughing at the end of Wolf Warrior 2 because it's such like blatant propaganda like the way he goes through um, the whole like field of like truth just by like raising the Chinese flag China like, what he I could not at? stop laughing when he just like raised the flag and then like all the like troops let him pass because he was raising the Chinese flag it's just like I find it to be completely ridiculous but I also think that you know China is allowed to make these kind of movies like it, made me feel like the kinds of movies action movies that like america made in like the 80s or some like where it's just commando like, really blatant, yeah really blatant propaganda and my opinion is just like you know what if this makes you happy like whatever yeah i mean like and, like i saw it's a comedy movie for me <laughs> I, yeah i could see that i could see that i i kind of think of a, a movie that fits between two of these sort of perspectives obviously i want to dive back into this conversation of you know, the the burden placed on a single movie to succeed. But there are also examples of movies that kind of transcend both audiences. Uh, Yang, in one of your movies, you talked about how initially you did not like Ip Man 4. And then after some thought, you said, wait, this is a a solid movie in how it talks about racism. Ip Man for for me was like a really cool movie because I got to see early, you know, like not even early Chinese racism has been going on since like, you know, the the late 19th century when Chinese people came to, you know, North America. But like it, the parts where he, they are talking about racism towards Chinese people and how Chinese people can be racist as well, I thought was super powerful. But this is also a Chinese production and Ip Man was is obviously a huge series in China and Donnie Yen is a huge star in, in China, but the Ip Man movies are also very, very popular here. Like, I, like, am I wrong in saying that it kind of fits between these two points of conversation that we have Chinese people wanting to see their stories created by them and watching, you know, American movies about Americana, but also American people consuming Asian stories like am, am I kind of incorrect here I'm, I'm, I'm... yeah I think um like um another example of um a breakout movie that an Asian movie that broke out in the west is Kung Fu Hustle and then just right like Westerners love that movie too and then it's it's well deserved I think um yeah and Ip Man well Ip Man also makes me laugh because it's like it's especially Ip Man 4 because of the whole plot just like I'm gonna take my son to San Francisco he's gonna go to school there Never mind. And that's never mind. mind. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Scott Adkins from Wolf Warrior One. Yeah, he was just it's, like, never mind. Uh, I'm not gonna do that anymore. Yeah. And the, I, I love him, man, because he's like he has no expression on his face when he's fighting ever. <laughs> and I think that um, I, Westerners see that as just like, and I think West Westerners like he fits the um, he fits the mold of like the really stoic like Chinese martial arts master, and he's just like doing all his martial arts while he just has no expression on his face. What were you gonna say, Yang? Yeah, I completely agree too. Yeah. I well, um, so the problem with um this kind of transcendence movies, like movie transcends cultural barriers, is is far at least to me, like from my perspective, I think it's far easier for a chi- 
for an American movie to transcend its border of uh, to be seen by people outside of America than the reverse. American viewers just aren't very receptive to movies that are not that challenging in terms of like a cultural depiction. Uh, it's quite, especially with, um, with like say the J-horror trend back in the 2000s where Hollywood felt the need to remake horror, uh, uh, Japanese horror movies with a white cast speaking in English uh, and adapting. And even though some of the movies are re- very well done where they took part of the Japanese culture and find a Japanese, uh, find a American equivalent so that the movie still makes sense. It ultimately is because the audience or at least Hollywood perceive that their audience are not interested in foreign media. And I think that's something that is also worth discussing um, and also worth bringing up as much as as much as I made a whole video kind of pissing on Shang-Chi. I, if, I do appreciate the fact that Shang-Chi exists and it even, even if it doesn't promote our story as Asian Americans or Chinese Americans, it does promote a sort of acceptance and pique people's interest in foreign medias eventually, hopefully. So that is one step forward uh, for the whole communication between East and West. Yeah, so so I guess your, your hope is that it encourages people to kind of dive into the, like, the filmography of Tony Leung and watch all of his incredible movies. Or, Just direct them to Lust Caution. Oh, that movie's awesome. That it's movie's kind incredible. of heavy, though. Yeah, I mean, but we, we kind of want that, though, right? We don't want all, you know, folks to be like, okay, all Asian cinema is, is action or action comedy. Like, yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. That, and, and that's what I mean by we want broader representation, but we also mm-hmm. want to encourage people to see Asian people, especially at a time like this, as, you know, a diverse group. You know, we can be heroes like Shang-Chi. We can be nuanced villains like Wen Wu. But we could also have these like really dramatic and heavy erotic films as well. Because, you know, if people go and watch Lust Caution, they are seeing Chinese people in a way they are never portrayed in the West. Never portrayed in the in, in mainstream Western media, Right. For me, I think a huge moment in my consumption of of Western media was actually, oh, it, don't laugh yet, during The Walking Dead. Um, during the what? Yeah. Okay. So, oh. so for for me, like my 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 partner is is white, and I never see couples that look like us in media made in North America, but in The Walking Dead. Steven Yoon's character, Glenn, forms this authentic and well-told relationship with a white character, Maggie. And it was something that, you know, in reading the comic books and, of course, in watching the show, deeply resonated with me because that was the kind of story I wanted to see. I can go and watch Chinese movies if I want to watch action films. I can go to watch Chinese movies if I want to watch, you know, like what I think to be hilarious propaganda movies like Jackie Chan's 1911 or, you know, like Wolf Warrior 2 or Wolf Warrior 1. I really liked The Walking Dead and Glenn because it spoke to my experience. Right? And Shang-Chi doesn't seem to do that. Oh, you know what? I know exactly how you feel. The Like the movie that made me feel that way is actually Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Explain. I want to hear this. <laughs> no, wait. Have you guys seen that movie? Yeah, I saw it in theaters. I, have, yes. I, saw, yeah, it in I theaters. saw it years ago, and it just gave me the feeling like it represented Asian, like Asian Americans in a way that like even movies in Asia don't because like they're stoners and you can't you can't have that on screen in Asia. So like it just represented Asians in such a like unique way. And like, but it's it's also like so realistic, like. It's just actually, I think back on it, and it's actually such a pivotal movie. Like, Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. It, it really is. And it's two Asian characters, 
right? It's two mm-hmm. Asian characters, like, like subverting a lot of, you know, that sort of model minority myth and those stereotypes. I would say like, yeah. well, what did you think of Always Be My Maybe? Which also does a similar thing. Oh, well, I've never seen that. What? It, it like Randall Park's character is also like an underachieving stoner Asian character, um, who wants to be a rapper. Um, oh my gosh! It's a very good movie. I highly recommend it. Um, I honestly liked that. I thought that movie to me was more impactful than like Crazy Rich Asians or or any of the other big ones. Because like oh. I like this one so much so yeah, that Aaron the- Kumar was like definitely infinitely more impactful to me than Crazy Rich Asians just because of like like that's real representation like like because the um, their characters are so complex like they fall into some stereotypes but then they're also like they break free of like so many expectations and like I think that's a lot closer to how like many many Asian Americans actually are. Yeah, and, and that's... Asian Americans party hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can I add that, you know, uh, Asian American is a very weird thing. People in Asia themselves think that, you know, Asian Americans are so... Str- it's bizarre, completely bizarre, because there is no such thing as an Asian identity. There are different people. And, you know, uh, there is when people say there is no melting pot in the United States, I think they are wrong. There's a really big melting pot that's happening because, for example, in Filipino, in Philippines, there are like uh, over a hundred ethnicities. And when you go to uh, United States in the census box, there is just one Filipino. So everybody turned into Filipino. And in India, um, in uh, even like Indian Americans, uh, that's that's really weird because uh, being Indian is more like a nationality. People from uh, Punjab, people from Gujarat, you know, they have different culture. Some different parts of India have their own uh, language and even uh, their own like movie industries, separate movie industries to cater to different audience. It's only quite recently they started like doing their pan-Indian cinema. Uh, mm-hmm. where it appears in all different languages. So um, that's why you know, sometimes when people from Asia look at you know, Asians uh, doing an uh, Asian thing, it is nothing that uh, they, they could relate to. So, uh, but in a way, it's brilliant because you know, it's a different evolution of uh, their culture. So they see how, they, uh, how one culture can change in different places. Uh, this is also a thing. There are lots of like Southeast Asian Chinese, for example, uh, but, you know, because they migrated at different time uh, during the dynasties or different uh, time period. So they brought in their older cultures and they evolved separately. Like, for example, uh, uh, Thai Chinese and Indonesian Chinese, not many of them can even speak Mandarin or write it because um, uh, they have like uh, assimilated more with the locals. And uh, some of their practices are really superstitious. People in mainland China would think uh, these people are crazy. They, they are like cultists. But you know, um, uh, when they're doing all the feng shui and stuff, because those things are a lot of them are uh, you know banned in China for good reason because there are lots of like grifters and people who are cheaters, lying con men. But you know, uh, those sort of things are quite uh, plentiful uh, in Asia. Feng Shui, for example, in Hong Kong, uh, because it was when it was still under British colony, Feng Shui was a really big thing. And uh, how they perceive their culture and how they evolve are very different. And for example, uh, also uh, with Wuxia novel, I think you really know a lot about this one, Daniel. Um, Jin Yong, yeah. uh, he's the grandmaster of uh, Wuxia. But the thing is, you know, a lot of his work is also influenced by uh, English literature, lots of Shakespearean uh, sort of like influence and all that sort of stuff, because, you know, he lives uh, in a in a British colony. And uh, Gu Long, he's from Taiwan, mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, Taiwan is closer to uh, J- Japan. It had more like Japanese mystery novel influence. So his, his wuxia is like wuxia noir, which is pretty cool. But uh, he's, he's mostly uh, more... Uh, uh, like it's more focused on the prose uh, rather than the actual plot, which he could be very verbose, but <laughs> not much plot sometimes. Uh, but it, it's like, um, I think, you know, 
even people in different parts of the world, even people in mainland China themselves, I think it would be good for them just to look at you know how the cultures are evolving through the, the rest of the world because mm, there is a, a bit of a like a invisible minority in different parts of the world. Like in Japan, there are lots of Japanese Brazilians, yes. uh, Japanese uh, Latin Americans that you know um, when they go to Japan. Uh, they feel a disconnect. They thought they are, they are Japanese, but Japanese think they are, they are really weird. Even for Koreans, uh, the, there are Koreans who are living in China, uh, ethnic Koreans who go there. Sometimes they are treated very differently, like Joseon Juk, and there's the Goryeo Saram. Uh, the, they are uh, the Soviet uh, Koreans. They were brought to different parts of the uh, USSR, uh, by Stalin or by by whoever it is, and uh, they have kind of developed a, a local lots of like Soviet uh, Korean culture. When they go to Korea, they feel uh, left out sometimes. Right. So I think it would be good for people around the world just to know that you know their cultures are evolving, and they can also evolve on different parts at different parts of the world. And uh, you know, that's I think that would be really cool for everyone to to know that you know, even though yeah, we are all like Chinese here, uh, we are come from different parts of the world. Uh, like my worldview are very different to a lot of uh, you people. I'm sure your worldview are quite different uh, uh, to the rest. Yeah, we, so, I mean, we all and, live in. I mean, three of us live in live in Canada right now, but we all live mm-hmm. in very different parts of Canada, right? Mm-hmm. And like. I mean that the Chinese communities in each of our our respective homes right now are all vastly different, like historically mm-hmm. and and like like culturally right now. I, I think mm-hmm. you you touched on something that I wanted to talk about, um, and it was actually a question that we had about sort of the burdens placed on you know movies like Shang Chi as a way of like representing Asian Americans, right? And, and I want to talk about you know the burdens of this term. Um, specifically, and the the kind of erasure that could come of this, right? Because if you say this is an Asian American movie, what do you mean by that? Like, oh, wh- you know, they mean like East Asian. Like when you hear that term, most most oh, yeah. of the time they mean East Asian. And then when you look at movies like Raya, because I know that you folks wanted you wanted to bring this up. When you look at Raya, and they're like, oh, it's a Southeast Asian movie. Who are we gonna cast? I mean, like, I no disrespect at all to the legend Daniel Day Kim. Yeah, no, they casted so many, like, I'm pretty sure among the main cast, there were only two actual, like, Southeast Asians, and the rest were East Asian. And that is, like, a giant issue with my movie. I actually have a roundtable with a bunch of Southeast Asian coming, Asians coming out, I'm hosting that, and... Sick. Yeah. When is that happening? What, oh my god, um, so we recorded all the different segments... And it has to be edited together. I'm, we're hoping to get it uploaded by November. It's it's so long, but yeah, um, Southeast Asians they had a lot of issues with that movie just because like I I do find it weird too that Disney was just like oh we're gonna lump eleven countries together <laughs> into this one movie. Yeah, yeah, it's just like <laughs> oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry. In in a way, Raya is like a. Really shows how behind the curve Disney is in terms of this kind of representation and cultural sensitivity because it pretty much is the same thing back in when Pocahontas was a thing, oh, yeah. uh, or like the OG ninety eight Mulan was a thing when back when uh, the dominance of Hollywood was much stronger and people are less picky about these kind of thing. Or, or like have no choice but to accept but now we have a choice to accept this and and this and Disney is still doing the exact same thing to utilize exotic elements from a generalized uh region without without the cultural context or without acknowledging where they actually are from specifically um it's quite pop it's increasingly problematic as time goes on uh even even like older Disney just loves this kind of throwback films, right? Even the recent uh, Jungle Cruise movie feels like a 1960s movie where pretend it's 1960s adventure movie pretending to be walk um, instead of actually <laughs> Wow. It ha- it has a gay character in it with a weird gay um, with a scene where he comes out of the closet 
that can be easily edited out so you get a Chinese uh, get a Chinese release. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but Disney is doing exactly what they have been doing for the past 50 years because it works and people are watching it, but we are becoming increasingly more sensitive towards this kind of uh, cultural eraser where it just lumps everyone into one single group. Yeah, it's almost like Disney is obsessed with profiting from nostalgia. Like, jump well, I think they're obsessed with like looking. I think they're, yeah, they're obsessed with expanding their princess line and being like, oh, here is our Southeast Asian princess. And I feel like they're going to reach their claws toward Africa next because, like, that's the only, is that the only continent? No, no, they're reaching their claws toward South America next. I'm sorry. Wait, did they, is there, a, is there a movie coming out for that? I think so. I'm not sure if it's a princess movie, but they're definitely, I think they're making a South American themed movie. But mm-hmm. I just, um, it's very blatant, like they're very blatantly just like only doing it to expand their princess line and being like, oh, hey, like here, here's representation. And they use like representation. They really pat themselves on the back for doing like the bare minimum and like not really trying that hard, just like putting aesthetics there. The The princess line is one that I am so so conflicted on um one i'm so upset it bothers me that mulan is in the princess line because <laughs> it makes no sense it makes no sense but at the same time mulan being there i remember when you know i was younger like my younger cousins mulan being in the princess line was so huge for them because they could get a chinese doll they could mm-hmm. see a chinese character like on all of this marketing so like i'm so torn because of like yeah mulan does not belong there but also like cj you said Mm -hmm. is it right to be this critical and negative or should we be Mm -hmm. having these conversations and pushing for something better so so i want to ask all three of you this you know we've talked about how these like sort of like labels these broad sweeping labels asian american uh you know east asian or or asian um can result in a lot of erasure you know of of cultures and you know inequalities right we saw that with crazy rich asians with the you know economic disparities you know we you see in education but also like shang chi and how it portrays you know what china is and what china you know what marvel fans should think of china and chinese characters what is the solution then? What is the solution to remedying the effects of you know these broad sweeping terms, or remedying the burden placed on actors like Simu Liu or Aquafina in representing you know entire demographics in histories and cultures? Like, what do we do? What is the solution? I think it would be a good idea. You know, we start uh, trying to label uh, the intention to. Uh, to express the intention of the uh, media better. For example, uh, who is this for? What is it representing? Or uh, is it just, uh, or just drop the whole representation uh, uh, marketing thing? You know, it's just movies. If you are in, uh, uh, I think uh, woke marketing is pretty bad because uh, it means that, you know, you are only watching this film for uh, its representation, for its social values, or it's trying to espouse when often these companies are not really that that sincere anyway. So might as well just make an entertainment movie. If you are uh, represented by it, uh, that would be great. Um, and uh, I think you know there is a, a bit of an issue with uh, these enter- large entertainment conglomerates trying to put in so many minorities at the same time. Uh, for example, the LGBT and the, uh, for example, in Raya, the LGBT thing that's being hinted at by by various media, I, when I saw that, it's it seemed really dangerous to me because Southeast Asia, Malaysia, and Indonesia are majority Muslim countries. They don't really welcome that sort of thing. Even the, the local sort of like... Uh, people uh, who are advocates for uh, LGBT, uh, that is that is a bit of an issue because they are being accused of perpetuating foreign culture 
even though you know uh, originally in in those places they have the local bungee culture and all that sort of stuff the third gender and so on is being uh, stamped out uh, by different religions and even uh, modernization westernization and now um they are trying to push all this sort of like values in it's a form of cultural uh, colonial colonialization different places have different uh, different ways of ex- uh, negotiating their uh, their gender expression or their sort of like place in the society for example in uh, uh for example in uh, the our, our names labeled uh, we have the he she or they something like that and it doesn't mean anything to people uh, with Chinese background because they only had one pronoun that's uh, ta that's it and it was only western literature coming coming into china when they have to like start start to translate uh, he or she into into writing uh, it uh, they started to add the woman radical in front of ta uh, that's that's how you know uh, foreign culture are like changing it now it's trying to change it again it's like give it a give it a break let people uh, manage it themselves because uh, there is a gender difference only in family uh, family relationship uh, elder brother uh, gaga and uh, elder sister jeje it's it only makes sense in relation to the family so they need to be able to negotiate this in terms of the family how how is their gender identity how their sexuality is placed in the context of the family and this is also how research done you know in like uh, taiwan because uh, taiwan has legalized like a gay marriage uh, what changes the conversation is how they frame it within uh, the context of the family uh, uh, it is how they are going to be accepted in the family and so on uh, different people uh, if you just use uh, this sort of western like talking point they are not going to just going to guide in smash things into uh, into like lgbt acceptance let people uh, sort things out their own way if they want to help talk to the people help the people um, empower them rather than just like coming in just telling them what to do it's just going to mess everybody's day right so i i guess kind of to you know, to kind of simply summarize what you said, you know, the the solution to kind of this harm that we're, we're speaking about in terms of like, you know, you know, movies like Shang-Chi or like broad sweeping categories or the expectation that a panel like this, you know, we're all Chinese. Like there is nothing inherently wrong about that. Um, but there's this expectation that this may be the only panel ever. So we have to, you know, have of as a, I guess, diverse of an Asian panel as possible. And I think, you know, the what you were trying to say is like, you know, let's drop representation as marketing, like you mentioned, and let's try to focus on, you know, telling good narrative, good stories, and, you know, try to, you know, do well with our research. Like I think about Mulan and how, wait, the director's not Chinese or the person who's like in charge of their costumes is like this white European woman. Is that, is that right? Something like yes. that. And yeah. like she was sent on a field trip to to China to like research the costumes of the era. Yeah. And then I just okay, actually this is something interesting, but after watching Mulan 2020, and then I went and watched the 2009 production of Mulan by China, and mm-hmm. then suddenly like even the first frame, the costume just made me feel so much more comfortable. Like yeah. I saw them and I was like, okay, yeah, that is what like these costumes are supposed to look like. Like I don't know what Mulan 2020 was trying to do. Yeah, there is. It's like they just kind of borrow from different time parts in Chinese history and then add these sort of fantastical elements to them. It's yeah, I, I, I yeah, I think Disney will put will quickly realize that uh, what the problem is because Mulan bombed so hard and Shang Chi is not even showing in China yet. Um, there's this whole. Right now, the marketing often from Disney is that, look at this, this is a movie we made about you, which is a very strange thing to do. Whereas in reality, really, a film should be a reflection of what the writer and the director, and in in some way, the editor and the musician, what their personal experience are. So... In marketing, it really should be, look at this movie. This is a movie we made about us. 
And this is a movie made by Asian Americans, Chinese Americans, about their Chinese American experience. It's that way that it narrows, for one thing, it narrows down uh, what the film is about, is going to represent. But in the um, but on the other hand, it also doesn't limit itself to a set group of audience because Hollywood is as a profit-driven uh, entity, of course, is very focused on audience perceptions, right? And this is why it guides, uh, guides Disney towards this direction of, I'm making a film about you instead of I'm making a film about us. And that's the that's to me is the main problem why there are so many movies that uh, ended up feeling offen- uh, feeling weird or strange, out of place or offensive to a certain group of people because it's essentially Hollywood's way of unintentionally expressing, this is how I see you and you should be this way. Uh, it's a very, it's perceived as a very arrogant, a very imposing way of telling people what to do, like CJ said. Uh, so, don't make a move. So just stop making a movie that are that are the well from from we have we have write a writer here. Let's just say, write what you know. Write your own experience, right? It's, it's not like oh, I don't. If you don't know about Mexican culture, maybe don't make a Mexican movie instead of just like oh, that looks cool. This looks cool. Day of the Dead is cool. So you just take all these elements, and of course, people are gonna get pissed off. You you are literally going into people's home and touching their things. Oh yeah. All right, which movie are you, are you talking about? Coco. Uh, Coco was actually fairly well received. In okay, yeah, because I, I was like, like, I I thought that movie was good. Uh, which movie are you referring to? Uh, I have no specific movie in oh, my okay. mind when I'm saying that. Yeah, it's just okay, a cool. idea that comes to me. But like, it can be done well. Like, if you hire people who actually from that background and has their experience. Yeah, Hollywood is. We often say Hollywood is a American. Well, we often say Disney is an American company, but they are far beyond just the border of America at this point. Mm-hmm. So they can do a lot of good things. They can also do co-productions if they really want to do make a say Japanese movie. They can collaborate with Japanese uh, studios, hire Japanese filmmakers to do the thing. It's just that right now they are trying to make foreign movies with local artists at the smallest possible budget. And that just does not work well. So what about- Also with uh, like the widest appeal. I think that's the reason why they made Raya like a representation of all of Southeast Asia. Cause mm-hmm. they were worried that, okay, if we just do a Vietnamese princess then only like the Vietnamese Americans are gonna come see this. So we have to like cover our bases, but in trying to cover their bases, they just made their movie about nothing. Exactly. Right, so we have, um... Stop trying to cover all of your bases and have that wide appeal. And also, you know, make a film about, you know, if you're a filmmaker, make what you know. Make it about you and not what you think. I, I think I CJ... Think just like make it from the heart instead of like, okay, this movie, we're going to cater to the Southeast Asians. And like, this is what we're going to do. Just like, it was, it's very clear to me that Raya was a movie that started with a script that had nothing to do with Southeast Asia. And then... Um, the Southeast Asian background was imposed on the movie from like it from outside. Like it was very clear to me. It's one of those like I think Netflix does this all the time now, where they have an existing script and then they just pin an IP onto it so that like people of the IP will come see it. But it's very clear that like oh this has like really nothing to do. Like it does not have the appeal of the original. You just hear to attract audiences, and it's just very, it's, that's why it feels very inauthentic. Right. I I think that you know. Yeah, I, I've been. I, I think all of you have you know have said something. You know, each of your points has been incredible, uh, and and honestly very thought provoking. I'm thinking about movies like Minari. Uh, Minari to me was the first movie that came to mind when Yang, you were talking about you know Disney failing because they tried to basically push their perceptions of what. Chinese people should look like or a Chinese hero should look like right a Chinese hero like just like your video said is one who doesn't actually help people in the west but a Chinese American hero is one who actually goes back home 
and does things in China only to come back and have people like, cool, fine, whatever, mm-hmm. you, you, right? Uh, I'm thinking about another thing that Disney is currently working on that I'm very excited about that I think is doing the opposite of what you said. And that's Star Wars I Visions. Was- what I, is that? I turns out we are not thinking about the same thing. Okay, <laughs> so this is good to talk about, right? This is why we have this long form. Uh, just to mm-hmm. answer your que- question, Shiran, um, Disney is coming up with an anthology animated Star Wars, uh, sort of a Star Wars animated anthology done by different Japanese studios. Oh, that's uh, fun to tell yeah. Star Wars stories in their style. Given obviously the the immense amount of inspiration that George Lucas took from mm-hmm. Japan's long and varied history. But but Yang, why do, do you want to elaborate on that? Because we do have some questions in the chat, uh, particularly about, you know, saying kind of like, write what you know. Uh, did you want to mm-hmm. kind of like elaborate more? Right. Uh, so a lot of people misinterpret write what you know as a way to, you have to do some kind of research before you do some kind of thing. But that's not what write what you know really means. Right, what you know is about things that you already have a deep um, understanding of. It's not that you know something, you have to understand it. Um, so there's this um, concept in philosophy called qualia. Say uh, an alien who cannot see, you can explain to them what light is, you can explain to them what electromagnetic radiation is, you can tell them everything about light. But since they cannot see, they will never understand the feeling of seeing light. The same thing is people who grew up in certain culture has this qualia about the culture that they deeply understand that you, if you are not from this culture, you will never understand or you will only have a surface level reproduction of it right so if you want to write something uh, if you want to write something make sure that you know it how it feels because film and pretty much all form of art is at the end of the day an emotionally driven discipline if you don't have the if, if you don't feel it you can reproduce that emotion behind your art and it will come out very hollow I think oh, yeah. that that, this, that oh go ahead sorry CJ right yeah this reminds me of that new film that's really rising in uh, China it's called Hai Mom or Ni Hao Li Lian Ying that's really incredible uh, it's it's currently it's competing against Wolf Warrior two it's climbing up the uh, blockbuster ranking uh, it is about to be honest it's really an isekai film where this woman is uh, and her mother uh, they are. They're hit by a truck. And, oh my god! Uh, literally, is this the one oh, where yeah, she travels back in time? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's the one. Uh, it, it's hmm. like a massive blockbuster. It's a right. It's the second more uh, top grossing film in China right now. Uh, but the thing is, it has some. You know that it, it has lots of like a uh, uh, cultural sort of like specific uh, emotion uh, that's connected to it. That's. Uh, I don't think uh, people outside uh, Chinese uh, culture could really replicate uh, this. The, the production is not the best. Um, the acting is not that great. Oh my god! Um, <laughs> the plot is uh, not very well done. Uh, but uh, with a twist, uh, with all the heart that's put into it, I'm really affected. Affected by it. It's something that's really personal to me. It's like uh, she's trying to. Uh, she's back in the past trying to give uh, her mother uh, the great life that she always wanted yeah, because there is this sort of like thing of filial piety that's uh, pretty uh, uh, specific to East Asian culture that's uh, that you know people living with a different sort of moral background with different sort of like ethics and may not immediately uh, recognize uh, this I think if you guys watch this, uh, it would be really interesting because uh, I'm sure you will be affected by it, but I wonder if other people will. This is very culturally specific, and um, but it's a China-only thing, I think. I I actually know about this movie because it came up in my research, and mm-hmm. I, I read the page on Wikipedia, and I was like, 
oh, this is this is too real. Like I was like, oh, I can't, I can't do this. Um, yeah, that I mean, it, it's a story that is very much a Chinese story. It's it, very much a Chinese story. Um, but yeah, when I was reading about it, I was like, oh no, I'm gonna like, not gonna lie, it's like I, I kind of want to call my mom. <laughs> It, like it talks to my mom um it, it's that kind of movie but yang i want to go back to you because you kind of started all of this by by saying you know you've pointed out a, like a critical thing here that shiran you've mentioned with mulan and it's this write what you know doesn't mean write what you've done a lot of research on it doesn't mean write what you know because disney has sent you on a field trip to china to to do some research yeah it's you know what you have experienced what you have felt and i think that's why so many people might vibe with the beginning of shang chi me too yeah because that's what the directors and the actors have felt and then when it goes into this like whole wuxia xinxia thing that's there's that's where that disconnect is created am i mm -hmm. correct in, in that's what you mean that, that's exactly how I felt about Shang-Chi. Like, it started, it feels, well, well, for one thing, it feels like an indie film, which is just right on my alley. But also, just seeing Shang-Chi going to karaoke, hanging out with friends, and being talked down to by the parents, well, by by Katie's parents, by uh, some, uh, well, elders, right? Senpais. Uh, there's just this, there's, there's just this feeling that I, I know the writer ex knows exactly what that feeling is. Yeah, like there are moments in the film where the writers' experience of these scenarios of being an outsider, of not knowing your own Chinese name, these kind of little small plot points shine through the crack. The, I, like at that moment, I know because the writer is also a uh, Chinese person, uh, first generation immigrant. Don't quote me on that. Yeah. Um, but like. They know exactly the experience, but because under the whole Marvel umbrella with a plot point that's planted 10 films ahead of time there's very little they can do so only moments of it shine through like the emotion of it the uh, the the experience of it and those moments are also happen to be the most effective moment uh for a lot of critics i realized uh, who are not chinese because there is a genuine experience behind it and people are feeling it, right? That's what I think Asian representation should be, is that other people through this film get to experience what we have been experiencing for our entire lives. That's powerful. Um, yeah. I, I'd love to, I, I want to talk about, so this emotion, this this experience of putting your heart into what you create. I, I want to talk about Shiran, like Iron Widow. Where are where are you in that story, and what what kind of got you to write that? Because I think we could talk about other creators. We could talk about where things have gone wrong and what they should be doing. But we've got one right here. Yeah. Two days. Well, Iron Widow. Two days. Your thing comes out, and is I it know, two days? Oh it's my two god! Days. Well, okay. Oh my god. Time zones. Time zones. It's two okay, days because it's yeah. it's past midnight. It's the nineteenth in Toronto. Oh um, my god, that's wild. But okay, Iron Widow for sure. I didn't write um the book, meaning for it to be like, um, just meaning for it to be like this piece of like literature that's supposed to be representation of like all Chinese. <clears throat> Like I didn't write it to be Chinese representation. I just wrote it, like the st it's the story of my heart. I wrote what I wanted to read and I what I like to read, and a lot of it definitely. But there is definitely a lot of like anger there toward just um, a lot of like stuff in Chinese culture that I personally don't like. But also like I celebrate a lot of stuff in Chinese culture that I do like, like a lot, a lot of history. And for me, I'm definitely like more into like Chinese counterculture than just um, what's considered mainstream Chinese culture. So like there's a lot of fighting back against like filial piety and like family values and that sort of thing. But yeah, but like Wu Zetian to me, she's a historical figure that represents a lot of like counterculture toward those kind of things. So like I celebrate that aspect because like Chinese culture isn't like 
Um, like I think outsiders tend to have a very, uh, very just a very narrow view of what Chinese culture is. But actually, like just even with from like within Chinese culture, the people pushing back against like um, like so-called mainstream values, those people that's like rebellion is a part of Chinese culture too. And I actually like I actually want to do a video on this like rebellion in Chinese culture because it may surprise some people, but like rebellion is an essential part of Chinese culture. <laughs> Like, if things are not going right for you, you rebel. You rebel against the emperor. You overthrow the dynasty. I mean, we've and, like, see, we've seen that. Then. We have seen that throughout history. Rebellions, mm -hmm. in fact, like one of these people here has has done an extensive video series. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Shout out to Cool History Bros. Uh, yeah. For incredible, incredible educational videos. So I, I guess in a way, you know, your experiences and what you see in, in your culture and, and how you engage with it are, are very much there, right? Yeah, for sure. And I actually, I got turned down by a Chinese editor um, because she was like, okay, this is like, um, I, I want something that like celebrates Chinese culture a little bit more, but I'm like, well, I am celebrating it. It's just, I celebrate the rebel side. Cause like, I am a natural rebel. There's, uh, <laughs> that's just how I am. I just, and I feel like I lost my train of thought there. Uh, the Chinese editor basically turned you down because it wasn't that kind of, it wasn't Chinese in their sense, but it was Chinese. Yeah, in their I sense. think so. I think um, there's a lot of pressure because I do feel a lot of pressure when I'm writing. Like, am I accidentally like playing into stereotypes? Am I like um, making Chinese culture look bad? But ultimately, I decided, you know what? I'm just gonna not think about that. I'm just gonna write the story I want because that's the kind of freedom that white people have. And why shouldn't I have the freedom to like write the kind of story I want? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I am so hyped to get this book <laughs> because. And it's it's funny though because I actually had to put um, a disclaimer at the beginning of my book that was like, uh, please do not expect like representation of actual history or culture in this. It's science fiction. But if you want to know about like the real um, Empress Wu, I did a two-parter series that goes into really comprehensive detail on her actual life. But That's like awesome. Iron Widow is strictly science fiction. It's just like a wild story with like like it doesn't even it doesn't exclusively have influences from Chinese culture. Like a lot of it, it's like influenced by anime too. Yeah, you've got the whole like the the mecha genre. Yeah, there. The mecha genre. I, that's I'm. It's a feminist take on the mecha genre. I'm very excited about this. Super excited. Um, I would love to to honestly in the in the future, you know, have you on Asians represent just to talk about that. Uh, I, oh yeah, awesome. I'm, I'm fascinated. Honestly, the rest of you too. Like all of your work is individually so distinct and and you know so impactful on how you know I you know engage with my culture and how you know I kind of think of myself as an Asian person in this space because we all kind of like fall into this. Uh, this is something I see in table talk gaming all the time. And, you know, Asians represent is, is the, the biggest Asian tabletop gaming podcast. And it's wild that, you know, we were the first show to ever be acknowledged for an any award, which is the biggest show in the award for tabletop gaming. Not Yo. once, but like twice. We got it. We got gold yesterday. We didn't even realize it was happening. Honestly, we, we were like, we, we won. What? But, but the Congrats. thing is like, one of the criticisms that you know, one of the criticisms that we get with the show is that, like, you know, you are not, you don't have, you're not getting every single Asian, and that 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 very purposeful wording, you aren't getting every single Asian, and we're trying, but at the same time, we cannot be the only show to do this. We cannot be the only people having these discussions. So. Like all of you said, Shang-Chi is a big step forward. It shows that Asian presences on screen and Asian creators behind the camera can produce something that can make enormous amounts of money. And I know like the amount of money is very relative given that we're in a pandemic right now, but it is still number one in the theaters. It is still ahead of the Ryan Reynolds led free guy um, I hope so. But I, yeah. Ultimately, uh, though, I just don't trust Disney. Like when the Shang-Chi trailers first came out, people like just mentioned me all the time, like being like, oh, my God, are you excited for this? Can you talk about this? And I always like I have always had like um, I'm, I was like, I am cautiously like expecting I don't have any opinions on this right now. I don't trust Disney. 
So we'll see when this movie comes out. And even now, I don't really have an opinion on Chang Chi because I haven't seen it. But all I know is that like a lot of my diaspora friends, um, they really liked it. But I also see that I like, hear from you guys that oh, like maybe those the first first gen immigrants or like an source line people, they don't they're not really vibing with it. So I'm gonna go and make my own judgment. But also I feel that it's perfectly valid for a movie to just be made by diaspora for diaspora. Like you don't need the acknowledgement of source land viewers to make it valid. Cause like source land viewers, they have a completely different experience than diaspora people. Yeah. Like absolutely. they don't like this is okay. I actually want to bring up like the Chi Pao issue. Like back, like I was going to bring that back, up. Think, there was a controversy about this white girl who wore a Chi Pao to prom, mm -hmm. and then people like uh, people from like Sor Source Land China, they were they didn't really see what the big deal with, and then with it, and then a lot of people use like their words to against the Asian um, like the Chinese Americans who were did have a problem with it, and I feel like you can't really compare those opinions because. Like people from China, they don't know what it's like to be a minority in a country. And so they're just like, oh, she's wearing a chi pao, cool. But then um, in America, as a Chinese person, like you could wear a chi pao and you go on go out on the street and you get made fun of by uh, for being like too foreign. So you have to consider like the differences in perspectives and you can't use. Um, I feel like there's this notion that like source land Chinese people are the real Chinese people and their opinions automatically like validate or invalidate a piece of media. And I don't really think that we should use like their like opinions as the gold standard. Like it's fine mm -hmm. for Shang Chi to just appeal to diaspora. Yeah, and I, and I think that's, that's why. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Yang. Sorry, that's that's why I was hoping Shang Chi would be from the beginning is a film for diasporas and and second, third generation immigrants, and instead of a, a movie that try to appeal to everyone who have vastly different experience in life, right? Yeah, but you don't think that it did a good job of like being a movie for diaspora? No, I don't think so. I like it uh, yeah. because I like it not because it has Asians in it. I like it because it's a decently well-made Mar Marvel movie. Whether or not it has, whether or not it fe features an Asian cast has very little with, to do with its overall quality. Uh, instead of feeling like, uh, say, the farewell where it's a story that is heavily rooted on the experience of a Asian diaspora returning to China, where if you change it to a white cast, it will look completely wrong. Whereas Shang-Chi, if you change half the cast to a people of different color, the film would not feel very out of place, to be honest. Yeah. I had a conversation with my brother today uh, about the movie since he saw it. And I asked him, I was like, did you like it? And, you know, my brother is very easily amused by, by like these movies. He, he's like, he's like, I go in to enjoy the movie. I got a ticket for day one and I'm going to go watch it. And I was like, awesome. Let me know. I'm, I'm waiting the 45 days. Um, and I asked him, I was like, well, how was it? And he said, it's kind of meh. And <laughs> his, his words exactly. And these are like fresh in my mind as of like six hours ago. He said, if this movie did not have the whole Asian representation sort of marketing or lens behind it. He's like, I'm pretty sure that people would not like it as much. He said, I, he said, I'm pretty sure that it would fall into the sort of the Captain Marvel sort of tier of beloved Marvel movies. Um, he said that like, cause my brother and I grew up watching a lot of like Hong Kong action cinema. And he's like, if I want to see really well choreographed action, we'll go, <laughs> We'll go to the blockbuster with that and rent police story, right? We'll go yeah. and, you know, watch those movies. If I want to watch a movie about the Asian diaspora, and he was like, Shang-Chi is not that. Just like Yang, you said in your video, it frames sort of Asians as these foreigners. And while the first part or the first bit of Shang-Chi is that diaspora story, the karaoke, mm -hmm. the partying, the, you know, disappointing your, your elders and their sort of traditional views on you. The rest of the movie is very much like, a, okay, cool. You're going to go back to the motherland and you're going to be a superhero there in this sort of orientalist, mystical pastiche of elements of visual elements of Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. And that's how I feel. And that's why I'm like, oh, yeah, Shang-Chi is a diaspora movie at the beginning 
and the rest of it is this giant visual shorthand for for how exotic Asian people are to the West. Oh, so basically, your opinion is that like if you wanted to see the kind of stuff that Shang Chi has, you would just rather go and see just like stuff made in Hong Kong. Yeah, like, where and, it draws inspiration from. Yeah, and and for me, like I made a list of the things that I'm excited about from a diasporic experience and from like a representation experience. Um, so I already talked about, you know, Stephen Yoon as Glenn in The Walking Dead, as well as as Jacob in Minari, I think are like two really different things, right? Glenn in The Walking Dead is never questioned for his Asian-ness, right? He is Glenn and he is a survivor and he is his existence in America during the zombie apocalypse is never questioned, which I think is the kind of stuff I want to see, right? Mm -hmm. Minari is also like they are dealing with some shit, real shit that people, you know, experience. So these are two different stories. I look at like, you know, Master of None, Aziz Ansari. That is the kind of story that, that I really like. You know, he's thinking he wants to be an actor and all these different expectations and is... You know, his Asian-ness is explored from his perspective, Aziz and Sari's real-life perspective, and Alan Yang's experience, who also did, uh, was it Tiger Tail? Am I getting that right? That movie that came out last year with Sima, the perpetual dad. Oh, yeah. Wasn't he the dad in Mulan? He was the dad in Mulan, yeah. So, yeah, Tiger Tail, I think, was the movie. And, and then I looked to Mindy Kaling as Kelly Kapoor in The Office. And while that is not my experience, I could tell that when that character has incredible storylines or is so well written, I know that Mindy Kaling wrote that episode because she put her real life experiences into that. Um, and then, of course, she ca hilariously cast her parents as her character's parents in an episode <laughs> on Diwali. It's very good. Everyone should watch that. Um, so so that that's the kind of stuff I look for. And so when I look to Shang-Chi, I think... Yo, see me represent Toronto. Love it. I love that kids can go to a toy store and buy a Shang-Chi action figure and feel like, you know, they have somebody they can look up to. But I want more. I don't think that Shang-Chi should be like, we made it, fam. That's it. This is the gold standard. I think that... Yeah, like this is the problem I have with Hollywood. Just, I think... Um, once they find like their one Asian actor, they're like, they use like five Asian actors and everything. And especially like Aquafina is such a big offender of this. Like, and they just stick her in everything. Like, oh, we need a funny Asian woman. Like, there we go. Aquafina, Aquafina here. But like, they're like, I think they're snubbing. I just know that there are so many like, um, aspiring Asian actors in Hollywood trying to get roles, but instead they just want to give it to that one big name and cast her in everything. Yeah, I don't been, think that is very fair or productive. Like you need more diversity and Hollywood is just like, okay, diversity is enough. If we just have like one person of this cultural background, like that's our person there. Yeah. It's like the, the John Cho effect because that was John Cho for so long. <laughs> yeah, That was John Cho. He was in everything. I'm like, Oh, you need an Asian guy. There's John Cho. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, like the burden we put on Shang-Chi for being the Asian American representation movie really comes down to no fault of the movie. It's just that even though we are talking about Asian rep representation for a few, for quite a few years now, it's still like one of the few movie that features a Asian majority cast in the last few years. And it's the only one that's like high profile enough for people to talk about it constantly is that the reality sadly is that as an as the asian as an like as asian community we are still very underrepresented in uh american media so right now there's only room for representing one small subgroup of people in the asian community at a time this problem hopefully will solve will sort itself out as interest in minority culture grew and there are more films made about us so that we don't just have oh, this is the whole asian american so asian representation thing but this is a chinese representation this is southeast asian this is vietnamese this is filipino like it, there's just not enough room for everyone to go in which is a shame because we have so many interesting culture and stories to tell but right now we just get one movie 
uh, above the hundred million dollar uh, budget line, and that's it, and it's not enough. Like uh, as greedy as it sounds, like it's just not enough. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think it's uh, it's it's greedy. I just think um, I do fault. I do, I guess I don't fault the movie, but I definitely fault the marketing team for being like, oh my god, this is like. Chinese like no Asian representation guys like if you are Asian you have to come see this movie because otherwise like it, this is the only movie like you have to come see this and yeah I I really don't like this kind of like representation marketing either because if you th- I think as long as you make a good story and it like resonates emotionally people will like watch it regardless because like just think of anime anime never advertises itself as oh this is representation of Japanese culture and, but like, and so there are so many anime that are just popular because they're good and people re- like resonate with it. And, but still, I think that like, if you watch an anime, even if you've been watching anime for like 10 years, you shouldn't call yourself an expert on Japanese culture in any way. Like I'm a giant um, anime fan. I would never think that like I could go to Japan and know what's going on. And so I think just like make good stories and give opportunities to people that um, you you think that like there there's a lot of like gatekeeping in these big media companies like just like for myself iron widow was rejected by every single american publisher it got sent to so it's actually being published by a canadian publisher and being pushed into america and now my pre-order numbers are just like through the roof just um i have like five figures in pre-order numbers and it's just like like every american publisher thought that this book wouldn't sell but now it's it's definitely selling and that's i don't know where the disconnect is um between the gatekeepers and the actual audience but clearly the gatekeepers were like okay this is too much this is like too chinese too sci-fi but the readers like the reader reaction so far i'm really grateful for it and they've been really good and it's um it's just yeah it's giving me all sorts of feelings because it just makes me think how many other projects by poc are being rejected because the gatekeepers think are thinking, okay, this is, I may like this, but I don't think this is actually going to do well in the market. Just that, I don't know. I have a lot of feelings about this. I'm, I'm Uh, excited for all those publishers to be like, fuck, we missed out. Cause one of those five figures is me. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) It's me. Oh yeah. I have, I, yeah, I have so many feelings, especially like the more hype that Iron Widow gets, like actually the sadder I get, because I'm just like, what happened back during when I, like sent this manuscript to all those American publishers. Like, what did they not see? Why did they think that this couldn't sell? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, you know what? And that's where I think, I think that's one of the positives of Shang-Chi for all of the, you know, the critique. And I think this is, this is, we're not haters, right? I think we're all haters of the Mulan movie, but we're not, we're not, we're not haters. No, but okay. Oh, and I think when it comes to stuff produced by big companies like Disney, we're like they we need to criticize yeah them because you know like they're always going to make money and if you don't like put some critic if you don't criticize them properly then they're just going to coast and we don't want them to coast we want them to do better and like exactly. disney doesn't need us to coddle them like of course like we should be more um for we should have like more leeway with our criticism with like small indie projects but this is disney they don't need us to be soft on them exactly so, and- yeah we should like critique it however we want because like and now they can see that um, a movie, an action movie with an Asian, with a male Asian hero, they, it could definitely make money. So hopefully that will make them open their doors up to more Asian creators. Or it could go the opposite and it's just a million Shang-Chi movies and they're all like that. Yeah, the cast seem movie and everything. Yeah, it could <laughs> hopefully be. Hopefully that will not happen. Yeah, like I want, I would love to see like a, like you know, the agents of Atlas. I would love to see like international Asian superheroes working together and working with non-Asian characters. I would fucking love to see that. And I think one of the big things about Shang-Chi's success is that on one end, yes, it does. Disney is like, aha, it fits the mold. Big CGI battle, heart-wrenching story, well-choreographed high-budget action. Let's just keep doing that because it makes money. But other studios may be like, okay, Asian movies are doing well. There is clearly a hunger for this, and this will do well. 
let's take chances on people. Let's give opportunities to others. Yes, yes. So, and I think the success and the fact that Shang-Chi could not have failed in and of itself is an advantage because we can all criticize it without being like, oh no, this was our only chance. No, it's going to succeed yeah. no matter what. Let's be critical, like you said, Shiran, right? Let's yeah. be critical because that is how we take it to the next level. Exactly. Like we don't need to be soft on Disney ever. <laughs> and that that said, I will I'm going to put this out into the universe right now. I'll put this out into the universe. When they go and they'll be like, "We want to make an Iron Widow movie." I, Daniel Kwan, would like to be an extra <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> in that movie. <laughs> Um, I mean, who knows? I actually do have a film agent and she was like, I don't know if we're ever going to get like a live action deal with this, but we'll see about like an, an animated adaptation maybe. But personally me, I'm just like, I don't, I don't really care for, like, I don't really, I don't really care about getting an adaptation because eh, I think it's fine. And It's like what every single writer says. <laughs> yeah. Really? No, every single writer, I think they want the adaptation, but also they're scared about what could happen to it. No, like that's what every successful writer says. Oh. Stephen King, um, what's his name? I'm oh. blanking out, but like that's a lot of a lot of successful writers don't perf- don't like adaptations um, just because they have a image in their mind and uh, it's not a film image. But yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah. So. I like I am indifferent toward this. If it happens, it'll be great. But I'm not gonna like. It's yeah. not one of my ultimate life goals to have an adaptation of. Like, but as like, fans, we still look for forward. To yeah, like, we're, we're, don't do I filmmaking for a reason. <laughs> I mean, we're we're here regardless, right? And the yeah. community is here for CJ and Yang as well because you two also make incredible content. Like I, Thanks. I know I'm, I'm all about like uplifting like the community, my peers, everyone else. Like we're all here together, right? We're all on our own journeys. I This scarcity mindset that they that we're trying to give us, it's like, oh, the, no, we all need to be trying to tell our own stories, right? And this is how we, you know, put these emotional, heartfelt, make what you know stories out there into the world, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that said, you know, we're, we're running out of time. So I want to make sure we all have you. You folks have plenty of time to to talk about what you've got going on and where people can find you on the internet and continue this conversation. I'm so hyped for this the, this the Southeast Asian panel that you've got coming out November time. November maybe. November maybe. I, I'm yeah. I'm hyped that more conversations are happening and that conversations are going to continue. Right. So if folks want to continue the conversation with you or learn from you in the conversations that they have with others, let's go on the overlay. We're going to go in. We're going to go counterclockwise because we haven't heard from you in a while, CJ, the person who oh. made this all happen. CJ, what, where can people find you on the Internet and what have you got going on right now that you want to talk about? Uh, well, Mm, well, I still have my channel going on. I have a project that I can't disclose yet. But what I'm trying to do you know, with my channel is to um, bridge the gap. Uh, even though it's like, even though uh, people read about like uh, Asian history, Chinese history, Japanese history in, in the West, you know, all the English uh, works on it are very limited uh, because there is a massive amount of uh, literature that's not been translated into English yet. It's just insane. Um, so uh, the way they learned about the, all these different Asian, Asian histories are very different than the way they learn it in Asia itself. And different parts of Asia learn it uh, quite differently too. So that's why I, I think you know, it's necessary to bridge the gap and not only that, to add the cultural context to it because uh, the problem is sometimes uh, the history is brought over there. They just look at the official history and so on. Uh, it is cold and it doesn't involve any uh, any uh, people or any literature or culture that's connected to the people who are living those histories. What happened is that you know um, the history is often separated from the literature and the culture, but you know that is quite wrong. Uh, the history is written by the officials and people who won the war and also uh, uh, by certain officials. It's been sanitized somewhat. Uh, it's missing a lot of story from the small people. 
uh, and how people feel about it. That's usually buried pretty deep within literatures and cultures and folk stories itself. So we don't know much about how the fee- people feel. We just think about the uh, you know often in the West. We just know that this uh, this empire attacked uh, another empire, but how do the people who are sent to war feel? There's lots of missing stories, even uh, uh, even in like uh, Western history itself. The Hundred Year War. That's a very stupid war. It's uh, at that time uh, England was conquered by the Normans, so uh, the English people. Are forced to attack French by French-speaking nobles, uh, the royal house, because they are fighting over their fief in France. So you know, we are just thinking that you know, oh, oh, well, that happens. That's that's why the English hate the French. But what do the people actually feel being sent by the by French people to fight other French people in battles that they don't really care about? So there are lots of missing contexts within uh, Western history too. And there's also a lot of missing context in a lot of Asian history. So I want to bridge the gap, but I'm just one person. I'm uh, looking at it from one perspective. Um, I'm adding uh, uh, like Western point of view, Asian point of view, and other uh, Asian point of view. For example, uh, if the history is connected uh, between uh, China and Japan and things like that, you know, there are lots of like. Interaction between all these different countries, China and Vietnam, um, that is missing in uh, all these histories. Uh, it's as if, like you know, if the if there is nobody to hear the tree fall in the forest, uh, does it make a sound? I'm trying to create this sound so that you know, Asia itself is interconnected. Um, it's it doesn't uh, its connection doesn't only happen when it is observed by the West. So I'm trying to tell a story from a different perspective. I think you're definitely, you know, succeeding. I think you, the videos you make are super accessible in their animated format. I love them. Um, I, I think, you know, bridging that gap between like, you know, history, culture, but also acknowledging that, yes, his, history, that, that, the very famous saying, history is written by, you know, the victors, um, I think is an important thing to acknowledge, especially, you know, given that if we're talking about Asian history, you know, Asian history and Chinese history in particular is just so nuanced. Um, you know, I, I spent like seven years in grad school and still don't even consider myself an expert because there are so many stories to tell and so many different perspectives on a single take. Also, I really, the Hundred Years War wasn't even a hundred years, <laughs> which is like... Wait, did you go to grad school for um, Chinese history? Uh, Chinese archaeology. Oh my God. Ooh. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, Yo, yeah most you people, probably know more than me. No, no, not at all. Not at all. I so my expertise is in ceramics. Um, oh my god! Yeah, and so what? What I, what I see ceramics in like movies. I'm like, um, oh no. Like for for me, I worked in Zhejiang Province, and I was on a team that um, d- discovered like the uh, the kind of like the or and were, was investigating the origins of rice agriculture globally. Like where rice? Why? When I would when I would talk to people about my research at the time, I was like, "Oh yes, I'm trying to figure out why Chinese people eat rice," uh, <laughs> and that was my 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 work in grad school. Um, oh my god! You know, I I really I would do um, a grad school program like that, but I'm like not built for academia. I'm not either. That's why I left. <laughs> oh my! God. I'm not yeah. either. Um, but you know, like I, I learned a lot there. Um, but th- but that said. It's not about me. CJ, you've got two incredible YouTube channels that people need to go watch. Cool History Bros and Don't Stop Thinking. Channels and everything like that will be in the description and in the show notes. Um, Of course, we have, you know, we'll share social media links and everything like that. Um, Y'all are awesome. So next, Yang, Accented Cinema. What have you got going on? What do you do? Well, right now I'm just very busy with the channels, uh, with the two-part series that's ongoing. Uh, I'm working on a series about the birth and adaptation of Gun Fu in Hollywood. Uh, part two should be coming soon. Uh, don't expect history from my channel. Uh, I'm probably the least qualified person about history in, in this uh, podcast. No joke, I actually... Re- uh, in, a, in an exam of our three kingdoms, I actually wrote Wu Kingdom on the map for three times just so I can get one of them correct. Oh, that's a vibe. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, I... I do not and- know that Shuan's in the South. That's like their main thing. 
I also don't remember how to roll the Chinese characters. Oh, okay. You know what? That's that's valid. I don't either. Okay, so uh, I am a Chinese. Uh, sorry, I'm a film school graduate. Um, so, although due to COVID, I haven't been able to make any films lately. Uh, I am currently in development for a short film that hopefully will be coming out soon on a not disclosed second channel. So you are getting a first announcement here. Oh, but uh, hopefully, in the future, I have the honor to direct an adaptation of Iron Widow. Oh my god! Okay. <laughs> I w- I'm extra manifesting this. Manifesting. I'm, I'm the extra. I want to be like <laughs> Mech Engineer number two. <laughs> oh, number eight. I want a better number. Number eight. Give me number eight. Um, oh god, you in the background in the jumpsuit. <laughs> I want the jumpsuit. I just want to have a hammer and maybe just like I'm banging on something with this hammer. Yeah. This my consider that my audition um, to both the the creator of the IP and potentially the future director. Um, yeah, Accented Cinema Yang. I'm super excited. You make some quality videos. Um, they are. I would say you know when you say like hey, I don't know history, I would disagree because you you know you talk about the history of, of genres like gun fu. You talk about how people are portrayed in media that is history like, yeah it, film history is that so that is history that is a part of our culture and you were out there documenting you know how our cultures and how they are captured and portrayed in film have changed so you are very much you know a historian an academic an educator thank um, you so i i think i can't wait to see what you do next because i love kung fu <laughs> i I unironically really like the movie Equilibrium. It had a. Uh, I what I actually watched it last night for research, and it aged remarkably well. A lot it, better it, than I was remembering. Yeah. It is um when I first saw that movie when I was much younger, I was like, "What?" <laughs> the movies, uh, yeah. Um, the gunfu genre genre is is very important to me, so I can't wait to see this this new thing you're putting out. And then the last one, last person here, she ran. Oh. Oh, also, yeah, I gotta say that my friends are like such big fans of you, and like they weren't impressed with my own YouTube, like me being a YouTuber, until you gave me a shout out on your channel, and they were like, "Oh my god!" What do you mean? I watch. You have more subscribers than I do too. I'm watching your channel like religiously <laughs> all the time. Oh my god. No, but that was just really funny because like my friends were like, "Oh yeah," my friends like don't even watch my videos, and it's fine because what? I realized that like. It's really important to have a like divide between friend versus fan. So I don't care if my friends watch my videos or not, because like I'm there for their companionship. They don't need to be fans of me. And mm-hmm. so like they were only impressed with me when like I got a shout out on Accented Cinema, it's and like then some... we bullied you into watching Future Cops with us. That was really funny. There's some Asian parent gene going on right here. I know, right? <laughs> oh my god. You, so I, yes, I I also have a YouTube channel. I'm just like Siran J Zhao on everything. I'm on YouTube, Twitter, um, what else? Instagram and TikTok. And I have my book Iron Widow that's coming out in two days. It is two days. Um, a sci-fi mecha reimagining of Empress Wu, the only female emperor in Chinese history. And I recently uploaded a two-parter, really comprehensive video series on her, like the actual details of her life. But like, yeah, my book is just a sci-fi reimagining of her if she were dropped into this like world that's besieged by giant mecha aliens and has like a Pacific Rim. They fight back using like these giant Pacific Rim robots, but the robots are designed after like Chinese myth creatures and they're piloted. um, They must be piloted by boy and a girl. And then she goes and finds out like, why is this so heteronormative and misogynist? And that's that's the book. That's Iron Widow out september 21st (laughs) i'm hyped i mean like it's been an honor to just speak with all of you and learn from all of you i deeply admire all of the work that you do um i mean like siren like i know that all of the people on who are working on the avatar tabletop rpg watch your stuff really oh my god um and you know, like I think you you have had a huge impact on people. I know in you know the Asian, all three of you have actually had a huge impact on the folks who are fans of Asians Represent because when we announced this, they were like, "Whoa, 
three of our favorite creators are on this panel. I'm like, most God. ambitious like, crossover. Damn it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, most ambitious crossover ever thanks to CJ. Now, honestly, you, you folks are awesome. I would love to do this again. And, you know, if you folks are watching on whoever's channel, wherever you're watching this or learning from this, if you feel like you have a story to tell, you have something that speaks to you and you want to put it out there in the world, do it. Look at, you know, look at CJ, look at Yang, look at, look at Shiran. I mean, Yang is currently a silhouette on screen, but listen, listen to Yang. And Yang, Yang is currently a dictator Conan, like, yeah, <laughs> not a silhouette, looks kind of like Benedict Cumberbatch for some reason. It, for me, all, oh I, all, all, no. I, all I could think no. of is like, <laughs> all I could think of is like, who's that Pokemon? Okay, so <laughs> that, that's, that's what's in my head. Being, I have to confess to being a former Cumber bitch. That's not me anymore, but that's it's not me. part of my past. That, it just, it's what makes you a more complex individual. You, you're nuanced. You are not I that a, anymore. But I have a dark past of being a Cumber bitch. <laughs> Look, it's, it happens. It's okay. We, we, we wouldn't judge you for it. In, in fact, you know what? Like, thank you for being so vulnerable. Uh, live um that said you know thank you folks for you know joining depending on where you are so late so early so i guess cj so mid midday um yes. yeah, but... so, so so midday um thank you folks who stayed up late to watch this and you know thank you folks who are going to watch this later and learn from this um go out there be critical of representation because we deserve better you deserve better and you deserve to be seen in the media that you consume um, that's it. The three of you, thank you so much. And, uh, on everybody watching us live, you know, we'll see you next time. Bye see everyone. You. Bye. See you guys.